I want to invite you this morning to turn with me in your Bibles. We're pausing our study in 1 Peter. We'll be back there next week. But turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse uh, 24. And as uh, somebody, two people have said this morning already, this is the annual pounding of the men. And uh, I think today I'll be going fairly easy on you. But uh, look with me at Proverbs chapter 16 and look with me at verse 24. Let's stand together as we read God's holy and inerrant word. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Father, we remember today and we think today about uh, the women of our congregation. We thank you, Father, for their godliness. We thank you, Father, for the example uh, that they set for us as believers. We thank you, Father, for the way that we see your unconditional love uh, reflected in their life. We thank you, Lord, for the way that uh, their stability and their steadiness, their deep passion for you, their desire to know your word, their desire to spend time in prayer, their desire to serve you and serve others. We thank you, Lord, for the women of our congregation. Lord, we look back on our own lives and we think about our mothers. We think of providentially the influence that they have had in our life and are having in our life. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you worked through them uh, in our life. And we thank you, Lord, that for many of us, uh, the reason that we know you, humanly speaking, is because of the gospel uh, shared so lovingly and so clearly through the lips of our mothers. Father, we pray uh, for uh, the mothers of this congregation. And Lord, uh, we know that uh, it's a joy uh, to be a mother. And Lord, it's a blessing. And the way that we're able to see our children grow up, and the way we're able to see uh, the fruit of labor. And Lord, we know also that for some mothers, it's a very difficult day uh, because of loss, because of thinking of those who are not with us today. And Lord, we uh, pray particularly for them. We pray for the comfort and the ministry and uh, the work of your Holy Spirit to draw alongside them. Uh, Father, we pray for the mothers of our congregation who are expecting, and we pray, and also those who are our children and our grandchildren that may be expecting, and we pray for safe delivery. We pray for healthy children, and we pray for children that your work of your Spirit will begin in their lives at the earliest of ages. Oh, Lord, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the way we see your hand through the women and the mothers of this congregation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. My son is getting married this uh, summer, and so one of the elders came to me and he said, I've got some uh, counsel for Hughes. And he said, I want you to express to him that there are uh, two important things to remember about marriage and that there are two important things uh, that make a good marriage. And he said, those two things are communication and cooperation. Communication and cooperation. And if you can remember communication and cooperation, you'll do just fine. And he said, now communication is you as a husband understanding exactly what your wife is saying. Communication for you as a husband is to make absolutely certain that you have clearly heard what your wife has said to you. And he said, that's the first part, and it is so very important to understand clearly what your wife is saying. That's communication. He said, the second part is cooperation. And that is where you do exactly 
what you have understood your wife to say. Today, we're going to talk about communication and cooperation. Men, you're on your own. But we're going to talk about communication today. Communication is so very important in the life of those who are married. Communication and our words that we use, we read in this proverb, Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing uh, to the bones. And what the writer of Proverbs is saying is that when we use good words, that those words can build one another up. They can strengthen one another. They can help us go forward. They can be motivating for one another. They can point us toward the Lord. They can bring peace in a very anxious situation. All of us have experienced good words from our spouses. But we also know that bad words, as James said, can be like a fire that burns and it blisters and it scorches and it can char. And only the Lord, only the Lord, and His power can heal such words. How do we as believers, how do we as husbands and wives, and specifically today, how do we as husbands speak in a loving manner toward our wives? These principles that we're going to look at from Proverbs, they apply in really every relationship that we have. But today, I want to direct these words specifically toward husbands. And I hope that these words will be, as it were, like a two-by-four. See, there it is, the the annual battering of the men. I want these words to be like a two-by-four that will convict you with the work of the Holy Spirit. I want these words to be like a light bulb that goes off in your mind. And through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you look in your life and you think, this is how I need to change. This is how I need to speak to my wife. And I want you to think about these words as being the gems of God in His Scripture. These gems from the book of Proverbs, and these are gems that you can take up and that you can give to your wife on a regular basis that will minister to her, that will nourish her, that will strengthen her in the Lord. So how do we communicate to each other as believers? How do husbands, how should you communicate with your wife? Where does it really begin? Where does it start? Well, it starts with what was just said by that elder to my son. It starts with intently listening. It starts with listening. It doesn't start with speaking. It starts with listening. Look with me, if you would, at Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13. Proverbs 18, 13 says, He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. The uh, example that Solomon is using here is of someone who is pleading a case It's someone who has something that he wants to say, as it were, before a group of people. And instead of listening, instead of understanding a situation, they just blurt it out. And he says that when that happens, it is nothing more than folly and shame. It means it's foolishness. And it's something that doesn't go away. It affects the reputation of that person. This can be like us as husbands. We get uh, uh, the the uh, check statement at the end of the month and we look through the check statement and we begin to read that there are a lot of expenditures and they have come from our wife and we go to our wife and we say, what are you spending money on? I cannot believe. And look, these, I don't, where are these? We've never seen these on, on the bill before. Where is this coming from? How can we spend this much money this month? And then your wife says to you, well, I'm getting ready. I was hoping it was going to be a surprise. And you say, a surprise for what? She said, well, I was hoping it was going to be a surprise because this is for your 50th 
birthday. Now there you are, with egg on your face. There you are, having blurted out something. You haven't thought, you haven't asked questions, you haven't tried to get any understanding, you just blurted something out. God says, he who gives an answer before he hears, it's folly and shame to him. The word that is the word for hear in this verse means to intelligently hear. It means not just to hear in passing. It means to listen and engage your thoughts as your wife speaks to you before you speak toward her. It means to engage your mind in what is being said. James chapter 1 says this. It says that we are to be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. And so, men, let me ask you this question. Think about it. Quick to, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Let me ask you this question. What, for the sake of memory, what cartoon character are these passages in Proverbs and this passage in James calling us to look like? If we could take our spiritual life and we could put it where it was visually before us, what should we look like, men? What cartoon character should we look like? Well, before I answer that question, I was in seminary class uh, during the time of the Neanderthals, and the teacher was talking about um, age-level Christian education. It was a similar class that I'd already had in college. And he begins to talk about how aging affects a person, and it's in the context of Christian education. And he begins to talk some about the physical characteristics of someone who is growing older. It's true of everyone. And the guy sitting next to me was my roommate in seminary. He was also a good friend, and we had gone through college together, and he immediately raised his hand and just could not wait to stop Dr., and I won't say his name, Dr. So-and-so, to tell him what we had learned in that class four or five years ago. Now, I knew what he was going to say, and I felt I almost pulled his arm down. I knew what he was going to say. And he raised his hand. He said, Dr. So-and-so, isn't it true that as you age, your ears continue to grow? Now, this doctor, this professor, had ears that looked like Yoda. They were huge. That's why I didn't give his name. They were huge. And that's exactly what we had studied years before in college, but we'd also studied something else, and this doctor was quick. And he looked at my roommate, who had a very distinctive nose, and he said, yes, Mr. So-and-so, but isn't it also true that your nose continues to grow as you grow older? What cartoon character should we as men look like? if someone could spiritually see us. Well, for some of us, we look like Daffy Duck. The only thing that you can see is the beak and the mouth. And for some of us, that is what someone would see. If they looked at us spiritually, they would see a mouth. That would be the most prominent thing spiritually that they would see in us. But James says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And men, if we were to graph that as a cartoon character, we should be Dumbo. We should be Dumbo. We should have huge ears. And those ears should be growing the older and more mature that we are in Christ. And we should grow in our ability to listen more and more. It's a mark of godliness. It's interesting to look at the Gospels 
and to look at the Lord Jesus Christ as he interacts with others in the Gospels. And what he does, you not only see him teaching, but if you study the Gospels and the interaction he has, particularly with individuals, you will see him listening. And that is interesting because he already knows what they are thinking, but yet he gives them the courtesy, if you will, of listening. God calls us to listen. How can we listen to our wives practically? How can we listen to our wives? Focus. Focus. Not what you're about to say. Don't be thinking about that. Not about what's wrong with what's being said as you think that. Not what you're going to do tomorrow. Or not waiting till this amount of sound will go by so that you can get back to whatever you were doing. But you show your wife love and you show your wife respect through focus. And that often involves stopping and it often involves, and most all the time, involves stopping and looking someone in the face. And I know you have had a child that would do this and this was the common practice of my daughter Sarah is that she would be talking to me, I would have my head in a book, or I would be reading the paper, and she would take her little hands, and she would put them on my face, and she would pull my face directly toward hers. Because she wanted to talk to me. Focus is needed. The second, very practical, is to make sure you clearly understand, and the way that you clearly understand is by asking questions and seeking to understand have I truly clearly understood what my wife is saying do you know men that so often our wives don't need a mechanic who can fix everything what they need in that moment is just simply a person who loves them knows them and will express that love through in listening focused listening listening to what they have to say and that's where communication starts it starts with listening intently listening now how should we speak then uh, how should we speak well uh, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 12 verse 22 Proverbs chapter 12 verse 22 Very straightforward words from Solomon. Proverbs 12, 22, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal faithfully are His delight. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal faithfully are His delight. We all know that we live in a culture, and this is true possibly now more than it ever has been. We know that we live in a culture where people are constantly lying. And they don't ever say they're lying. They never back up, even though it's obvious that they're lying. It happens all the time. We live in a culture that is accepting of lying. They accept lying as being a part of life. God takes lying seriously. The word that is used here is abomination. It's the same word and same attitude that God has towards sexual perversion. It's the same attitude and word that God has toward idolatry. And he says lying fits in that same category. Why is it that God is so opposed to lying? Why is it as Christians that we are called not to lie and particularly not to lie to our spouse. Why does God say that lying is an abomination? Why, why doesn't he just view it as, as words that happen to go by that might be, a, as someone said, lying is a very present help in time of trouble? Why doesn't he just view it in that way? The reason is, is because God is truth. And to lie is to go directly against his character. In Numbers chapter 23, 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, 
of the Son of Man that he should repent? Has he not said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except by me. How can Christ say that he is the truth? And the answer to that is that just as all of life derives itself from Christ, all of truth derives itself from Christ. And so lying is an abomination to God. After we become believers, after we receive a new heart through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, and we turn to Christ in faith and repentance, and we become a new creature in Christ, Our life begins a process of sanctification where part of growing to be Christ-like is to be a person who is absolutely committed to the truth. And that does wonders for a marriage. Every time, imagine your marriage as being a bank. And every time you tell a lie, you not only withdraw a a withdrawal from the bank, you go bankrupt. And it takes a long, long time to restore solvency of trust. But when you tell the truth, you're making a deposit in that marriage in the bank of trust. And that trust becomes a transparency that both husband and wife are thankful for and very comfortable and secure in that transparency. And it builds increasing oneness. It builds increasing reliance upon one another. It becomes a joy in that relationship because as a man, you know you go out into a world where there are lies. But you come home. And there's truth. And you're thankful. And women know that there are lies out there. There are people that lie. But they know they can trust their husband. They know he speaks the truth. Speak truthfully. If you lie, confess it. Confess it to God. Confess it to your wife. Ask for God's forgiveness. Ask for her forgiveness. And through the power of the Spirit, repent. Become a man of truth. God would have you to be that. Secondly, we need to speak in a way uh, that helps us as believers uh, to speak thoughtfully. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28, to speak thoughtfully. It says, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Notice here the contrast between the righteous who ponders, who considers, who meditates, who thinks before they speak. And yet the mouth of the wicked simply pours things out. It just talks. Whatever happens to be on the mind, whatever happens to be stirred up in the heart, it comes out. No pondering. There are three boys who are bragging on their dad. and The first boy said, uh, my dad, my dad can speak an hour on any number of topics. Second boy said, well, I can top that. My dad, my dad, he can speak for two hours on any topic. Third boy said, my dad, he can top all those. He can speak all day long without any topics. This is what's being talked about here. To walk with the Lord is to begin to ponder what we say. It's to begin to evaluate what we say based upon God's Word. It's begin to seek to be one 
who simply doesn't, as this word for whoring is translated in other places, who doesn't simply blurt or gush or even belch out words. There's a heart that seeks to think through what's being said. How many times, and I know I can say this of myself so often, how many times have I said things to Sally that I wish they had a string on them and I could just bring them back in because I had not thought about what I was saying. I remember being, right after we got married, we'd been married probably for two months, and Sally was a good cook. She was trying to do very well in her cooking, had to cook for somebody who ate about three times as much as she did. And we went to her mother's house and had a wonderful meal, and we were riding back home, and I just said what I thought, which was stupid, because I was stupid. And I said, sweetie, I think I know the difference between your mother's cooking and your cooking which is stupid, and it, it gets worse. I said, your mom uses spices. <laughs> I don't think you do. And that's just a kind of humorous example. It gets a lot worse. <laughs> How often as men have we not thought before we spoke and wish that we could just reel it back in? How can we speak thoughtfully? Turn with me to James chapter 3 verses 13 through 18, and then uh, this is an exercise for you today if you would like to take it, and that is, is to memorize uh, this verse. If you look with me at Proverbs chapter 3, I'm going to simply read verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 is the key verse. How can we speak in a thoughtful way? Well, one way is that we seek to speak with wisdom. And this verse in James chapter 3 gives us a list of what wisdom looks like. And so we can commit this verse to memory. And as we're having a conversation with our beloved wife, we can think as we think about how we're going to speak that we stop and we ponder and we can ask ourselves, how do, our, how do my words match up with what James says is the mark of true wisdom? So look at these words with me. We can ask the question, is it pure? He says, but the wisdom from above is first pure. And so we would ask ourselves, is this something based on the Word of God that is right before Him? Or is this coming out of my selfish heart? He says, then it is peaceable. Isn't that interesting? Is it something as I speak to her that will bring reconciliation instead of division? Thirdly, he says, it is gentle. Am I speaking kindly? Fourthly, he says, is it reasonable? Does it make sense? Is it good? Is it based upon Scripture? Fifthly, is it full of mercy? Am I speaking with compassion? Is it full of good fruits? Does what I'm about to say further God's purposes for our life? Is it unwavering? Is it consistent with who I am called to be and who God is? And is it without hypocrisy? Is it truthful? Am I really being real with my wife? Am I being transparent? Consider how to thoughtfully speak. Consider even memorizing this one verse and using it as a gem that God gives to you so that you can give the gems of this type of communication back to your wife on a regular basis. Thirdly, we're to speak gently. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. This proverb focuses not just on what we say, but it focuses on how we say it.
And that's very, very, very important. A man's wife returned from a wedding, and he said, how did it go? And she said, um, I think that marriage is going to have trouble. And he said, you were able to see that there? And she said, uh, he said, well, why? Why do you think the marriage is going to have trouble? And uh, she said, uh, when the groom said, I do, the wife said, don't use that tone of voice with me. <laughs> and so this proverb speaks not only about what we say, but it speaks about how we say it. Many times, men, we treat our wives as though they are made of Kevlar. We treat our wives as though their heart is encased with a bulletproof vest. And we shoot our words like missiles. And we think that those words are simply going to accomplish whatever purpose we have for them, and then they simply go away. They bounce off. Well, if we were to do a study about our speech in the entire book of Proverbs, we would find two things about speech to be true. The first is, is that words have depth, and they don't bounce off. They go to the heart. And the second thing that we would learn from the book of Proverbs is that they have not only depth, but they have breadth. And they continue to do their work for years. And they can be repeated either accurately or inaccurately, and they can redound over and over and over again. And what Solomon writes about in the book of Proverbs is for us as believers to recognize that potential and to use it for good instead of evil. When you encourage your wife, when you fill her heart with good things, when you lift her up and you speak to her in that way, it isn't just something that goes in one ear and goes out the other. It goes into her heart and it stays. I have a file that I keep here at the church that are on from people in right words of encouragement I keep those. And when I have a particularly bad day, I may pull those out and I may read them, knowing that the whole world actually does not hate me. I also have at home a drawer, my sock drawer, where I keep cards from Father's Day, keep cards from my birthday that Sally and my children have sent me, the written words on those cards that mean much to me. And I save them. They're a treasure of mine. And that is the same with you. As you speak good words, you minister to your wife. You fill her heart. And that gives her a strength to keep going. When she's very anxious, you speak words of peace. And you, as it, as it were, husbands, you throw an anchor out of that boat. And it helps her endure that storm. We do not understand fully what the writer of Proverbs is speaking about, of how powerful our words are. A gentle answer turns away wrath. And then fourthly, encouragingly, we're to speak encouraging words. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. And look with me at verse... 25. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Men, God calls us to be encouragers to our wife, to be encouragers to our wife. A good word is life-changing. What are some of the practical ways that you can be encouraging to your wife? One is to give sincere compliments. 
Do you give your wife sincere compliments? When she fixes her hair in a certain way, do you notice that? And do you tell her that? And do you tell her how pretty that looks? When she may be uh, dressed up for a certain occasion, do you look at her and say, you know, you just look beautiful tonight? Do you do that? The Song of Solomon is Solomon getting ready to meet and to meet his future bride. And it is filled with praises that Solomon has for his future wife. Men, do you still treat your wife like a bride? Do you still sincerely compliment her? It builds her up. It helps her. It encourages her. Do you compliment her? Do you tell her thank you? That's another way that you can encourage your wife. You know, we, we take so many things for granted. We come home, we're tired, and there's a, there's a meal in front of us. You know, that just didn't get there. It is, you don't have gremlins in your house that come in and make those meals. Someone took a lot of time to do that. I go to my, you know, after I got married, I thought it was magic. I would wear clothes, and I would go to this second drawer down, and there would be those clothes again. How did that happen? It's incredible. It's amazing. Who does these things? I have clothes I'm wearing right now that I've been helped with so that I could, I could look somewhat presentable this morning. How did that happen? Someone helped me. Do you say thank you to your wife? Do you look for ways that you can say thank you? When was the last time you did? This gets convicting, doesn't it? When was the last time you can remember saying you were thankful? A third way is to look for ways that you can build your wife up. You know your wife. There are times that she goes through, and you know she's going through those times. It may be something with the children. It may be something to do at work. It may be something to do with the extended family. You know that she is discouraged. Do you come alongside of her and become, as it were, a physician for the soul? And speak to her good words that help her. Do you look for ways that you can help your wife to be encouraged? You know, as businessmen, you, we work as entrepreneurs and we're looking for ways of making a profit. Our eyes are toward profit. Well, do you look at your wife and you think, how can I profit her? How can I be used of God to give her a better day? Sincere compliments, genuine compliments, saying thank you, looking for ways that you can encourage your wife. But let me give you one more. Tell her that you love her every day. Every opportunity you get, tell her that you love her. My goal, I try to tell Sally that I love her as often as I talk with her almost at home. If I'm good, anytime that I leave, I won't say that. But any time that I'm leaving or any time that I call, I try to say I love you. And my goal is to say that I love her until she says, why don't you shut up and stop saying that? And when she does that, I'm still going to say that to her because I love her. Tell your wife that you love her. And tell her early and tell her often. Tell her that you love her. How can we do this, men? We can only do this by speaking dependently. We can only do this through the work of Christ in our life. Uh, James, as it were, puts the question, the tongue is such a restless animal, who can tame it? And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 answers that question as well as many others when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The way that we can speak as we should to our wives is through dependence upon Christ. Why is that the case? Because our words are a reflection of our heart. And 
the only one who can change our heart is Christ. And so we must walk in dependence upon Him. He can transform us. He alone can transform us. And so today, as we've talked about this, maybe in this area of your marriage, maybe in this area of your life, you're convicted that this is not the way it should be in your life, that you are not where you need to be in the way that you're speaking. Well, my encouragement to you is not to begin to go on a self-improvement plan, but my encouragement to you is to turn toward Christ and to submit yourself to Him and to seek His work in your life. And possibly today you have heard this and it actually has convicted you because you know that your heart isn't where it should be. And you know that you need a Savior. You know that you need forgiveness. You know that you need a Lord in your life who will transform you. Possibly even through a message on how to talk to your wife in love it would be a message that would draw you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he, he and He alone changes the heart. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank You for the women of this congregation. Lord, thank You for their godliness. Thank You for the way that their speech through the years has ministered to all of us in so many different ways. Insights. Listening to prayers. Deep prayers. Listening to words of kindness and encouragement that has been directed in our way. Father, we pray that you would forgive us for using our words in a way that harms. Forgive us of criticism, being critical. Forgive us, Lord, of tearing down. Forgive us, Lord, of complaining. Forgive us, Lord, of constantly looking at that which is untrue instead of thinking upon that which is true. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be people who speak the truth. Help us to speak thoughtfully. Help us to speak gently. Help us to speak in a way that edifies, that encourages, that builds up. Work in us, O Lord. May we see transformation in this area. Help us to apply the word deeply to our heart in obedience. And Father, I pray for any here who do not know Christ. I pray, Lord, that this message on using our words might have been used by your Spirit to cause a person to reflect on their own heart and that even today, they will cry out to you, Lord Jesus, give me a new heart. Change my life forever. Forgive me. Declare me right through what you have done in God's sight. Oh, Lord, may they come today, come even now, through your word. We pray this in Christ's name. May we stand for the benediction. Now, ladies, don't forget your flowers. Let's receive the benediction. Now, may God's grace and His mercy and His peace be with us both now and forevermore. Amen.